All right, one last check to make sure the kiddo is sleeping. How on earth has she put herself in that position? I have no idea. <laughs> I got to hold this up to the camera because it's so ridiculous. She's got the feet. Are you ever going to be able to see this on the camera? God damn it, I don't think you are. Because this camera just isn't good enough to focus that fast on a dark screen. Maybe no camera is. What a way to bounce back with the podcast. I don't know how she's got herself into this position, but at least she's sleeping. It means I can turn off the background noise and welcome you back to the Anagwis Dollar podcast. What's happening, folks? Um, what are we? We are December 4th today. It feels like an eternity since I was here. Uh, a little bit of a different look here if you're watching on YouTube. Tons to get to. But the main focus of today's episode, after we take care of all the little things and update you all on what's been going on, uh, the main focus is to take a look back on the last five videos I posted to the main channel in this series I'm calling Could I Play Bass With? Um, as I thought about doing this, I was like, am I just starting to make reacts videos as well right now? People are going to look at my channel and go, oh, he's making covers and he's doing reacts videos. What happened? We used to dig this guy. I also think I'm probably going to be out of focus on the video. It's kind of far away. Interesting. Okay, well, we'll work on that. Oh, that will really bother me. But okay, not the end of the world. I'm just trying, throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks right now. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not making covers because these aren't covers. Um what I have been doing for my entire career actually is learning other people's music as a as a Simon, as a freelance musician and exercising that muscle of ear training, of transcription, of sort of time restriction, if you like, um, sort of goes by the wayside when you don't do it uh, for a while. So I was like, I want a way to bring that back. And I just threw one thing up there. I've been listening to this Dirty Loop song, this circus arrangement, this Britney Spears tune that they did, I don't know, over a decade ago, maybe 10 or 11, maybe 12 years ago at this point. I was like, let me see if I can play along to that. And I had this thing called lalal.ai. It's like Moises, one of these AI devices. They'd been a sponsor of the channel previously. I had some minutes left over. So I ran, uh, ran the Dirty Loops track through the through the AI processor to get rid of the bass. And it was uh, mostly successful. There's some obviously Henrik Linder soloing moments where it wasn't really recognizing those as bass and didn't remove them perfectly. But it was enough to play along and just to learn the song really quickly, put my own spin on it, I guess, sort of figure out what I might have done had I been in the studio on the session, tracking the song or maybe in the writing process with some of these. And I threw it up on YouTube and you got a bunch of bunch of views people seem to dig it and i was like i dig the process of doing that the actual you know and like i said exercising that muscle of transcription and of learning music in sort of a time restricted fashion so that's what i've been doing uh the last the last week when i've had the time um we're going to take a quick listen to some of them i'll give you my thoughts my own feedback as i listen back to them and some things that have cropped up since i recorded them that i've kind of feel like is worth sharing uh just in terms of you know what i'm doing con conceptually in places and why i chose the song perhaps just just a bunch of things that i thought oh that doesn't really translate in the song itself and maybe it needs a little side note sidebar to uh to, to bring people in and and sort of explain what i'm doing in places uh before we get to that um it's been a crazy few weeks uh, the SBL podcast, no, not the SBL podcast, the SBL main channel interview dropped a few days ago. That's been going amazing. I've had really positive feedback about that. It's a two hour and 15 minute interview, I think. It's not short. Um, I'll link it in the show notes. Highly recommend going to check it out. We got to a bunch of things, very fun conversation and uh, a lot of things covered. Scott had done his homework, remembered things or had found things rather that I had completely forgotten about. So um, yeah, thanks buddy. <laughs> roasted me in places uh trying to remember things i'd completely forgotten about so that's been happening i've also contrary to what i said in that interview actually we talked briefly about books and about how jeff bezos takes 40 percent and but despite the fact he does that 
when I sell a book, you know, giving him 40%, it kind of pays for the shipping and the packaging and the printing and all the customer service and all that stuff. And I'd never want to do that and blah, blah, blah. Well, fast forward to this month and I've actually started selling actually now worldwide. I was going to say in the US, but we do offer shipping worldwide now. I've actually been doing limited runs of my books, author signed copies. So I sign them and, um, and mail them out to you guys. So those are available on the website. Want to let you know about that. Um, if you are not in the US, um, it's a little more expensive, unfortunately, because the USPS it, over here in the States is not not the greatest. They're not the friendliest with the, with the purse strings, but we do have a flat rate international option. Um, so just make sure you're on an international shipping page to get your country to show up in the address window. But they're there. Some of them are sold out already. I'm doing reorders. They've been that popular. It's been totally crazy. I haven't done physical products like this probably since I sold some CDs online when I first made Mystery to Me almost 20 years ago. So it's sort of rebooting the... Uh, the, the small business slash entrepreneurial side of physical product portion of my brain. And it's been really amazing. Like I'm, I'm literally going to the post office every single day with tons of books to mail out around the country and around the world. So first of all, can't, say, can't tell you how much I appreciate the support with that. And it is it's really a massive difference, as you might imagine, a 40% difference. In fact, um, not giving Jeff Bezos such a huge cut of the proceeds um and it sort of gives me some uh some hope and uh for the future of the business and being able to do more stuff and it's also uh reminded me that the whole process isn't like it was 20 years ago when i was selling cds it's a actually a little bit more streamlined and a little bit more business friendly in just just in terms of how i'm able to set it up here and have all my supplies and you know print stuff at home and uh, you know, print shipping labels and do all that stuff. So it's actually quite streamlined, doesn't take up too much time. And it's really nice to be signing these things and sending them out um, to people who care enough to to, to want to do that. So massive thank you to you all. Um, like I said, there's a reorder coming in of, of physical books. So I'll have a bunch more that will go back on the website in just a few days. And there are still a bunch of them left. So check that out, yannickwistala.com. It's all linked in the show notes and in the description of the video below. Uh, before we get to the reaction portion of this, one last little thing is actually uh, to do with the podcast itself and to do with where the home of it might be in terms of the video. The audio will always be available at Apple Podcasts and Spotify and all, the, all your normal outlets. It's just a question of whether I want to continue trying to grow this portion of the of the youtube thing with with, with a dedicated podcast channel we've got like a, a really a bunch of people following and and are engaged and subscribed which is awesome i'm just wondering if the podcast might get a little bit of a wider audience and uh, and maybe be more effective if it was on the main channel which has a significantly larger number at the same time it may hurt the sort of the, the algorithm and all of that in terms of people discovering the channel because of having short form content and long form content. I mean, I could bore you to tears with the amount of uh, stuff I've read and listened to and watched about what you should do uh, when trying to be most effective with your channels, having one channel, having multiple channels. So I'm still thinking about that. You could definitely chime in um, as to A, whether you're more about watching it on YouTube, um, and if so, whether it would be more convenient to do it all in one place at my main channel, or whether the dedicated pod podcast channel is kind of cool. Um, so wherever you can leave a comment, um, do that and let me know. Give me some feedback. And let's get into the tunes. Uh, I'm so out of practice with the podcast. I got to slowly ease my way back into it. But yeah, like I said, I posted the... The Dirty Loops one first. Um, it's Circus. It's, you know, my buddies, you know, Yona and um, Aaron and Henrik. And especially Henrik, of course. We probably the closest, uh, definitely the closest out of the three of them with, with Henrik. And um, really fun, you know, it wasn't like I was, I was going to say really fun learning the tune. But I wasn't really learning the tune. I mean, listening to it since they put it out. And it's not the most densely, you know, harmonically populated thing in the world, although maybe it sounds like it at times, the way they finesse it and, and the way they put their, their spin on it. But when you listen to it 
and sort of zoom out. That's going to be the theme of, of listening back to these things and sort of explaining what's going on. When you zoom out and you listen to the macro picture and the bigger picture and the, the patterns that start to emerge, that to me is when you start to um, consolidate the form and get a real feel for the song. So it starts becoming something, not something you know, but something you'll really never forget. And the more you can listen to something, anything you're transcribing or learning ahead of time, the better. Of course, that's not always possible. Sometimes we run a real time crunch and it's um, sometimes a matter of minutes, sometimes hours, sometimes only days. And uh, I've been in all of those situations, minutes, hours, days, weeks, never I've never been given months to learn music, I don't think. Um, maybe some of my own, I've written it so far ahead of time, I have had months to learn it. But uh, yeah, I've, the, the challenge has been to learn it quickly and to... Uh, and to make the video, I, I don't have the time to just spend hours and hours and hours uh, every day making these videos. So I actually need to make them quickly as well. So let's check a little bit of it, see if something leaps out um, and I can discuss further. So this definitely isn't a reacts video because I've seen a few of those and people spend the whole time going, oh, oh, dog, oh, my man, what the fuck? And, whoa, whoa. It's yerble, yerble, blurble, blurble, blabble, wabble all over it. So uh, it's definitely not that. Um, I think this is actually more about uh, like the, the, the creative self-criticism element of what I go through when I record my practice. Let's treat it like that because it's really no different from just recording a practice session. I just happen to share this one. I happen to actually spend a little bit of time on it and present it to you guys, um, you know, in HD <laughs> with, with, without mistakes for the most part. Um, but in terms of what I listen back for, uh, for myself to improve, it's normally as I, as I've, have said millions of times and will say millions again it's all about time and sound so i'm actually quite happy with the way the time and the sound came out on this obviously it's a very different approach from henrix in terms of sound um some of the things we do are quite similar in time i think because we have very similar influences and have practiced some similar things for sure um but definitely with the with the sound, it's different. And of course, I, I didn't play any slap on this and Henrik plays some slap licks in the tune. So I knew I was going to take those out and add my own thing. I guess that's another uh, good point to make is that this is all about kind of adding my own thing as well. It's not about transcribing the player's bass part note for note and then just trying to nail it exactly the way they did. That's to me, not so much fun in that at this point in my life. There was huge amounts of, of value in that when I was younger because I was, you know, trying to assimilate a lot of styles of my heroes. Uh, but at this time, I'm at this point rather, I'm, I'm really trying to find something new every time I pick up the instrument. So, you know, especially when it comes to something that I know this well and a player like Henrik that I not only know his playing, I know him as well. So it's there are already so many connections to the music without me playing the exact set of notes. So, um, yeah, as you can hear, I kind of went, I'm not going to say crazy far away, but far enough away to, to know pretty early on that it's not Henrik playing 
and that some things, uh, may, <laughs> some things may be potentially wrong with it uh, if you're a massive Dirty Loops fan and you, and you like the original. Um, so I know there are going to be people out there where it's like kind of jarring. You know, you, you know something so well for so long and then you hear a different take on it, but it's almost the same. That's, that's got to be weird. It's weird for me playing it, I got to tell you. Um, but already you can hear form-wise that we've heard similar chords from the intro. They've come back. You know, there's repetition in the in, in the verse quite a bit, and the the transitions were the thing that okay, I had to really hit those because they're in unison, rhythmic unison with the band, and there are some um, notation unison things with, with the as an ensemble. So those were those were the sort of the transcribey bits. Everything else was pretty much bigger picture and just chord symbols, and then do my own thing, comping wise, and kind of hope that I played the nice licks on the take that I, you know, that I ended up wanting to to share with you guys on YouTube. Um, let's listen to a little more. I guess we don't have to listen to the whole thing. You can go listen to these. They're on the main channel. They're in a playlist right on my channel so that is called "Could I Play Bass With?" Um, let's listen to a tiny bit more of this. I guess that's the case in point, right? That was the... Uh, Henrik plays a big slap lick there and I, I opted for a fingerstyle thing and sort of triplets and pushed into the into the hit. Whoops. Yeah. And it's by no means perfect either. And I'm not sure what perfect would be, actually. And <laughs> now I say that out loud, I'm not even sure what I would call perfect. But I do hear the flaws in it. And it's more, as I think a lot of these are, maybe with the exception of the John Mayer one, because that was so, I was so studio sort of headspace for that. Um, these are really sort of li live uh, renditions. They're all, um, I think they're all one takers. I mean, they are. They want one live take from start to finish. I think I muted something on one of the tracks. We'll find it at some point just because I came in early and I didn't want it to ruin an otherwise kind of nice take. So I just muted it in the end rather than edit it out. But you see me play on the video and there's no sound just for a couple of notes where I realized I was in the wrong place. But for the most part, what I'm going for is a, is a live take from start to finish. And, you know, conceptually in the approach to it, in the in the lead up to actually filming and recording these things, I just play it as many times as I possibly can so that when I get down to hitting the red button, it's all about, you know, the first and maybe the second take. There was one, I think, on the Noah tune on Overtime where I hit the wrong button on the pedal and that blew the take. Otherwise, it would have been take two. That was feeling really good, but I did have to go and do a third take on that one because I just ballsed up hitting the button. Um, and I guess we'll go in chronological order here. I think the next one I put out was the Animals as Leaders one, if I'm not mistaken. That was two weeks ago, and the Animals as Leaders was... <laughs> 12 days yeah exactly a couple of days later um i sat down with the the woven web animals as leaders tune javier reyes matt gasca tosin abasi you guys know again finger style well actually with this one there is no bass player at least live with the band i know they had uh i think jacob umansky played some stuff on one of their records and they've you know traditionally tuned down a lot of the guitar stuff and maybe use some emulators and plugins and that kind of stuff um i know it's not like there's no bass on the record but their, their bass takes various shapes and forms it's not like you can just point to one player that's playing on a record so uh not sure who or even if there was you know playing bass on this particular track or whether it was tuned down guitar riffs um but i just went finger style and it was yeah really interesting playing with a band who is who is quite known for not having a bass player when they play live
So just two sections um, so far. And <clears throat> I got a lot of feedback. About, oh, man, that's such a complicated tune. And, and I, I don't want to like belittle any of the, the sort of really deep, um, A, the re deep respect I have for all these musicians that are, whose music I've been playing uh, the last couple of weeks. And I, I don't want to diminish any of the, like, the... Um, incredible hard work that goes into writing and producing and recording and performing all these songs when i say it's not a complicated tune that's not a slight at all we're going to get to a john mayer tune that literally has four chords in it so we you know we, we when i say simple it's not a negative thing um but i guess some people took it as though oh what are you you know what are you shitting on it or something like that you think this is simple blah blah, blah. well actually yeah and i, I just i really want to share why and how I hear it is quite simple. And when I say simple, I don't mean easy. Uh, you know, simple and easy are two very different things to me. And actually, the John Mayer tune was maybe the hardest one to play out of all of the five um, and it, uh, that, I've, that I've done so far. And it had the least amount of notes uh, and the least amount of complexity in its form. So, yeah, so in terms of this, of the woven web being simple to hear, when I did zoom out and listen to it repeatedly, I started to build up those, you know, components of the form and understand that there were these you know three maybe four riffs in total but like three main ones i think uh, well, we'll have to keep listening I, I forget now it's been a couple of weeks but once i heard that i was like oh this repeats so that's like already it's uh, uh if it's three riffs it's like only a third of the work you really have to do in terms of knowing what goes where or knowing a certain amount of material then it's a question of threading all of those things together and you know developing the part and the idea to be cohesive and, and that's where it's not simple that's where you really have to i guess have some skills in that department as a producer as a writer as um I get, as a musician, of course, um, as a fan, I think, as a listener, like, you know, you know how you feel about a certain kind of music when you hear it and how to convey that energy when you're playing it is a, is a, is a really useful skill, I think. It's something that sets a lot of our great hero, you know, studio bass players as, apart from the rest of them, like the Will Lees and the Lee Sklars and Anthony Jacksons and Marcus Millers of the world. You know, the Sean Hurleys, the Neil Steuben houses, the Nathan East, these kind of people, they they really have that uh, innate ability to to connect with the song and therefore connect with the audience in a big way. So th those are all the kinds of things I'm thinking about and finding simplicity in the form and finding a bigger picture rather than, rather than worrying about the minutia earlier, early on in the process is a big key. To kind of getting through this stuff pretty quick and and pretty effectively. And aside from that little fill on the nine there, I'm pretty much doubling what's already on the tune, you know? It's only when we get to the thump section in a minute that I made some melodic choices along with along with the band's uh, rhythm. And that made it a little more technically demanding for me, you know. And I'm not playing with any effects here at all. I'm not playing with any overdrive, with any EQ, with any preamp. I'm straight into the um, into the Ampeg Venture V3 and out of the DI into the into the interface. I use an Apollo. Uh, what is that? UA Apollo X8 or something? The, whatever, the, the Universal Audio Jobby. So it's really clean, like it's straight through and very clean. And that was sort of my approach to it sonically was just, I'm going to play pretty straight. Like I'm not going to go grab a dark glass pedal and get all, you know, jacked up on distortion and crossover and low compression and high gain, oh, blah, 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 all of those things that you could. I was like, oh, I'm actually going to do what I do and let's see if that works. Like, can it work in... Um, in a in a very well known and much heavier situation, and um, yeah, that was a, that was a challenge in itself, being really clean and really present in the mix. Sort of no 
nowhere to hide. I think you can find places to hide behind reverb and distortion and all those things, and it can sort of um, can mask a few deficiencies uh, in your playing from time to time. And um, so it was a nice challenge to to just play totally clean and and try and make all of these I- I execute all of these uh, choices I'd made musically. I suppose I should also mention that um, we moved the bass studio. Uh, that's since disappeared from the Teachable platform. It was just it was not the not the uh, not the thing I had hoped it could become in the end. And I've moved it all to Yanagwasdala dot com, and it's a massive move. Many thousands of things that I had to move over there. It's slowly. Uh, slowly getting towards the finish line in terms of that but all of that to say uh of course i closed down the subscription side of it quite some time ago um but the, the there were a few courses on the site that were hugely popular and those are courses i've made available um just as standalone things and things that will sort of constantly grow one of them's the live archive where i post hundreds and hundreds of videos from live concerts uh, throughout my career and obviously moving forward as and when they happen that's where I'm posting them so that's a place where where you get to see like the real the real deal in terms of the long form of what some of those tours are like and then the other one one of the other ones is the transcription vault which has had a bunch of jazz stuff in it for the longest time and um as I started doing this series of, you know, could I play bass with uh, on YouTube? I was like, oh, this would be great. Sort of to do what I'm doing here in the podcast, talk about it and sort of, you know, give my thoughts behind the transcription process of these songs. So I'm slowly adding these five. I put the first one in there today. I did the Noah one that's in the course. I'll add the other four that are currently there. And then the plan is to every time I do one of these is to add sort of the almost like a lesson video, a breakdown um, of how I approached the transcription and what I chose to change and what I chose to keep kind of my my inside look into the process. So those are going to yeah, continue being added. As with other stuff as well, I put a Brad Meldow thing in there this morning that, that I need to launch. And um, yeah, I'm always adding little little bits and pieces, little details of transcription, things that are really exciting me musically. Um, as, as I go through my process, that's obviously a thing that's constantly being updated and evolving. Um, so if you're interested in that, those are linked below in the description of the video. Um, there's also a tab in the navigation bar of my website yanagustala.com it just says base courses and i've put like four or five courses in there um this one just seems most relevant as we're uh, talking about this is exactly (laughs) kind of what i'm doing in those videos um on an ongoing basis and uh yeah it seems to be seems to be popular i know people like the like to sort of peel back the skull and look inside the brain and see what's going on. I know why I always wanted to do that as a kid. I had to go to master classes and clinics like live in person and ask people questions, but it, you know, it's uh however you can get at it and this is the way I'm able to to provide that to people. So that's there, that's the transcription vault. It's at the it's at my website. Everything's under the under the one umbrella now. No more no more multiple websites to go to. So um yeah. Oh yeah, the heavy section. That's right. I was like, what's coming next? I know there's something fun here. So uh, having said, yo, I just went clean and blah, 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 no pedals and no dark glass. I did actually grab a fuzz pedal. I can't remember actually. Shit. I can't remember which pedal I used for this. Oh man. Shit. Did I even use a dark glass pedal? Am I completely full of shit right now? I don't know. But I do know I used the MXR bass octave deluxe i think that's um i think i see mike lee using that one um maybe even timmy as well tim lefave uh i'm not sure um like the guys who don't use the brown box kind of use that one i think i've seen tim use both but um yeah it just seemed to track nicely and give me that sub in this section underneath the underneath the guitars
Anyway, you can go and annoy the neighbours with that one on your own time if you want to listen to the rest of it. Um, I think next up was, was it the Noah one? I think it was the Noah one. Oh, maybe not. Or was it the John one? Shit, I don't know. Let's let's go with the Noah one and then we'll mellow out with John in a second. So just two sections. This is the verse right here. Just descending from F sharp all the way down. I only found out afterwards this is Timmy on this track. I didn't realize this was Lefebvre. I uh, assumed it was Sam Wilkes because of the time period that the album was made. I don't know, but Tim was a, was a guest or maybe even did the whole record. I don't know. I should ask him. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, I didn't know that going into it. That might have influenced my choice of song, you know, not to shit all over Tim's part. Like I really, again, I, I don't mean any disrespect uh, when I do this. I'm just like having fun and I'm taking the other person's bass part out anyway. I'm just doing my own thing. And I kind of went a bit nuts on this one. This is probably the most I would like step out of the out of the box potentially and it was just like quite open harmonically as well and rhythmically so and you know someone like lewis is so strong like I, i've played with him once before some time ago and it was i, I still remember it. it's just just an incredible time feel and and awareness of space um so when when you have that it's it I like to think it's a. It's. I felt it was a very similar awareness of space that uh, to, to to mine, which maybe made, made it really really fun to play with him. Sort of had listened to a lot of the same stuff, I think, and influenced by some of the same people. And it was just when that happens and you fall in the pocket, you can get you can get to so many places, so many fun places. So, yeah, playing on this track just reminded me of all of that and maybe the adrenaline ran a little strong in the veins on this one. <laughs> already so much repetition uh, again none of these things are bad just uh just keys to the match so to say so to speak you know how to how to get to this information internalize this this song quickly and assimilate this sound as fast as possible in order to be at a point where you feel like you can record it um so yeah just a lot of f sharp in the verse and then in the chorus here a lot of a flat g flat f and around it goes the little you know uh, f sharp to e to e flat with the e flat becomes the five going to the one of the next section that's just the little transition thing in the middle other than that boom off you go could play this around and around for hours i mean it's the kind of tune that i could go on up to a noah show in the 10 years time and nail it to the wall not because i'm some sort of savant but because it's really you know it's the two key centers basically and as long as your time is great and you're locked in it's uh it's not the, not the most difficult thing to to nail and super fun you know It's going to be 19 hours long if I don't get through these. But there's a section in the end, again, where I dropped in an octave pedal. So playing regular. A little chordal action right here. I 
I like that octave pedal because it tracks really well. You can still play kind of busy and pointed and concise. So, <clears throat> yeah, recommend that for that kind of sound. All right, we've got two more here. We're going to mellow way out with uh, Queen of California, John Mayer. I thought this was a really underrated record, Born and Raised. Uh, was this 09 or something? It was oh, No, no, 12, something. I don't know. It's like over 10 years ago. Sean Hurley on bass, Aaron Sterling on drums, maybe David Goodbye, Ryan Harris as well, Goodbye, Greg Lease on uh, pedal steel. Goodbye, but for this version, <laughs> me on um, on a Fender P bass, uh, decided to switch up the bass. Um, bass has got to be 10 15 years old now the strings have got to be probably 12 or 15 years old on it at this point as well um i had this bass in the studio when i played with john uh when we cut that bob reynolds record together in 2011 but actually i think i played the music master only with john um yeah and it was way more challenging than the amount of chords and the density of the notes would would have you um yeah, I don't know, would would, would have you uh, kind of believe. Um, definitely, yeah, definitely a challenge to get the pocket right um, and, and, and like really find where the, it didn't sit in the place I thought it sat having listened to it for a while until I got in the mix, until I was able to extract the bass and... Yeah, and be the bass player for the first time. It's like, oh, that's where the time was. So very interesting there. Quite a steep learning curve on that one. Um, easy enough song to learn. Like I said, it's only four chords, maybe five, something is really not difficult at all. It's all diatonic. First chorus, first chorus, first chorus. There's a guitar solo in there. Chorus comes back, like really simple pop form. I think it's a great song. Uh, love the band, love, love everything about it. And um, yeah, very interesting to get to be in the mix. And uh I'm heading out west with my headphones on, holding a flat with a song in the back of my soul that no one knows. I just found out a ghost left town. The Queen of California is a stepping down. I really, I, I got to point out a couple of things I liked about it. You know, it's easy to be critical and oh, I missed this or there was, I wish I'd done more of that. Um, I did like the way the E string sounded uh, on this in places, like that open E when it went down, I thought it sat in the mix really well. Where is it? Hello, oh, it's before that, right at the end of the, there. I just found out a ghost left town California is stepping down, down. Oh, it's so simple, right? It's just an open E string. But you put it in the right place at the right time and, and just let it ring. You're like, oh, yeah. I remember why I love like so much of the bass. And, and yeah, I like the fast high stuff and the melodies and the chords and the high C and all that stuff. But man, I just as much, if not more, love that one note literally that one note and the song like i'm singing the melody i'm singing the song i know the words i like all of those things about it and learning how like when you solo that when you when you're in the mix and you solo the bass and you listen to it raw and you're like mm. I don't think I could listen to this very much on its own, but then you put the rest of the band back and you're like, oh, I could listen to this forever. The difference between the raw sound of the P-Bass and the in-the-mix sound of the P-Bass, <clears throat> night and day, and figuring out like how to create that sound that you sort of hate listening to on its own, but sounds perfect in a mix, that was uh, that was something that took some time and um, took some time to get comfortable with. I'm very happy that I am now and that I can listen to it and know what's going on and is sort of highlighted uh, at this point, you know, uh, quite nicely to me, to my ears, to to remind myself, oh yeah, because I haven't played P bass on a pop tune like this in a minute, or on tour for you know every night playing tunes for a little while. So nice to do that. And I played this song a bunch before I recorded it. I not was this the first take? 
Maybe this was only one take. I can't remember. Now I'm, I've, I've done five of them in the last week. I can't actually remember what's what at this point. So, uh, But we're definitely going for low number of takes. This might have been only one because I played it so many times along with the track. You know, I might, might have played this tune for 90 minutes straight before I ended up recording it. Um, and that really helped, you know, that really helped with the, with the, with, with getting it down in, uh, in one go. Hello, All right, let's go with the last one that was just posted this morning. I recorded it last night, learnt it yesterday afternoon in about 30 minutes or so. Um, I had a message from Will Lee, I commented on the video earlier on. I pinned it. I was, oh man, because that's my hero, you know, that's like... He's one of the, just one of the greatest uh, for many, many reasons, not just the bass. He's like, that's so nuts to learn it in 30 minutes. You only said you attempted to, but no matter, it's complex and amazingly well played. Yannick, kudos. That was from Will. So that was beautiful. I was really kind of him to check it out and to leave a comment. And um, yeah, I mentioned somewhere, I think, I, may, I think he's on my mailing list. So he saw the blog and I mentioned it in there, talked a little bit on the, on the newsletter about it. And uh, I did actually learn it in 30 minutes. There was... Um, <clears throat> A couple of things. I mean, I learned. That's the other thing as well. Like, I learned the song in thirty minutes. I I learned the form. Um, I learned the chords. I learned the notes and the and the licks and the riffs. You know, a lot of this uh, this stuff. We, we're talking about Pliny here, Electric Sunrise. I'll play the track in just a second. Um, a lot of this stuff. The, the animals as leaders. The periphery. The um, yeah, what's this band? Interval. Somebody said I should check out. I checked them out. This guy Jacob Umansky. A uh, lot of slap a lot of stuff i don't do so that would be an interesting one if i could do one of those songs and do it sort of my own thing and again no diss to, to jacob just uh i would i would definitely take a different approach because that's just you know best use of my time doing this that's the bigger challenge for me um so yeah it was just uh i i did learn all the components of it in 30 minutes it doesn't it, it's not a finished product in 30 minutes maybe that's what i didn't explain so well Maybe that could be classed as being very impressive. Like, oh, you've never heard this before. And then 30 minutes later, you recorded it. No, 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 no. 30 minutes later, I had learned it. 30 minutes later, I wasn't ready to perform it. Definitely wasn't ready to record it. And that took some repetition to get it into sort of, you know, gig ready, if you will. And be like, yeah, okay, I think I could go out on the gig and do it. And hey, the, the, the take went down in, in one go. It's one go from start to finish. You can actually see in this one the logic track in the background. It's the second take. You can, or I'm looking at it right now. You can, or you can actually see the, um, the, uh, the previous take there because it does um, you know, like those playlist things. So the previous take is there, and it, but it's incomplete. I can see that it's only about two thirds of the song, and I think I gave up on the first take. So maybe this is the only complete take that I did. I didn't realize that until I'm looking at the graphic right now. I'll double check that, but I think that's right because I didn't do another take after this. Because I because what happened was it was late, and I was setting myself the goal. I was like, even if I'm not done with this, I'm going to bed because I need to sleep, and I want to be better at doing that and shutting down the work side. And it did get to just after this take. It kind of chimed midnight and I backed everything up. I was like, I'm going to bed. And when I got up this morning, I listened to it again. I was like, you know what? It's actually not a bad take. There's a mistake at three minutes and I think 12 or 13 seconds or something. I was like, I can live with that. It was like a comping mistake behind the solo and yeah, quote unquote mistake. Who knows? I'm just fucking around having fun. So who, who, is it really a mistake? Um, maybe if I was on the gig and I did that, Pliny would look around and be like, hey man, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and it would definitely be a, a mistake or I don't know whether it was quite a fireable offense, but it was definitely something that made me consider, uh, do I really want to post that one or should I do another one for safety? And what I didn't want to do was do a repair on that one bar and then have it not match the video. Because I think that's sort of, I, I don't like that. I don't like when the, the audio doesn't match the video. Um, so, in the end, I got up this morning, uh, and before I took my daughter to daycare, I was like, you know what, I'm going to finish this, and I'm going to put it out today, because I think this take works. And this is uh, Pliny Electric Sunrise. And I did a little arrangement. There's just a, a single note, ostinato, in the beginning. So I think it's in 13. I don't really know, actually. And uh, there's, yeah. Yeah, I think it's in 13. Um, 
and there was just a single note. That's the intro, the original intro of the song. So I hope I didn't piss off any Pliny fans by uh, reharmonizing it. But this is what I ended up doing with it. I guess one, two, three, one, two, three, one, one, two, three, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, and I dropped the E down to C sharp. So that was my sort of, the, as far as I went to be appropriate for the music. Again, no distortion, no, <coughs> no uh, Adam Nolly get good impersonations or, um, oh my God, I'm going to forget his name now. It's Simon, tell me it's Simon Grove. It is so, oh man, come on, don't be so old and senile, it is Simon Grove, right, Simon Grove, Simon Grove, yes, ha, oh. sorry Simon, if you're watching, I had an old man moment there, don't worry, you're going to get to that at some point, um, and uh, you'll pay it forward too, I'm sure, <laughs> um, but yeah, okay, yeah, I, I wasn't doing any uh, get good or grove impersonations on this one. Um, just went went again finger style, but I did tune the the E string down to C sharp, and I have a hip shot, so I was playing um, regular E uh, when I was playing the chords in the front, and then you know dropped the hip shot down right before that big note came in for the low C sharp. I gotta say, I'm very, very impressed with the Matteson 20, uh, 22, 32 inch scale <coughs> with a 105 E string tuned down to C sharp. And to me, it sounds kind of fat, I gotta say. Um, like, could it, yeah, okay, could it sound like a, you know, like an Anthony Jackson, like a piano string or something, like huge and long and, and round? Yeah, okay, maybe. But in the context of this mix, I think it works. Mm. anyway you can go listen to that whole thing um and yeah the concept there was just to support the music you know to support what was going on play the unisons make all the hits and and kind of have fun and not yeah, try not to butcher it you know it's like it really is could i play bass with so i'd like to think at the end of the process of each song here um that i had done us done sufficient enough uh work on the music and the song and the concept for the answer to be yes i mean that's my goal each time is that it's i'm asking the question but the, the it's you know I would I, I do these I am doing these because should the should the um you know hypothetically speaking if the if the option should come up I would should, I would say yes and hopefully the answer would be yes that I could do it so that's the that's the challenge um and I'm sure I'm going <laughs> to it's going to be no on some of them and I I'm sh I know I'm going to find some that are already no to the point where I can't even play the music um, I can't even get it to the point where, uh, where, where it's playable and, and where I could even make a video about it. Um, I'm going to give you, we're, we're going to end here for those valiant, uh, 
coffee drinkers here and podcast oops where are we uh podcast fans uh oh my god come where is this thing i'm gonna give you where is it um i'm gonna give you a sneak into what i'm thinking about doing i just don't know whether and i just don't know whether it's going to be physically possible um one of two tunes this is one of them Yeah, so I hear you all saying, hey, good luck with that. Um, I keep saying, yeah, good luck with that to myself. And what's the other one? Is it this one? Yes. The massive piano intro, but once it gets going into the... Here. Oops. So one of these two I want to do. Obviously, playing all that stuff, you know, not, uh, you know, playing all that stuff in unison on the bass. That's that's a challenge. That will really, <clears throat> that will really load my chops up and uh, sort of get me gig ready for anything. So that those, but those again might be tunes that I just could never get close, and that in turn could make a could make an interesting video or an interesting uh, story in terms of like you know not could i play bass with but holy shit remember that time where i absolutely couldn't play bass with and that's gonzalo rubalcaba by the way that's on an album called rapsodia uh from the 90s 19, 96, 97, no sé, pero es muy difícil. it's a big challenge and um yeah you also can't find that record on any streaming so you're actually gonna have to own it what a concept uh i do own it i've had it since i was you know, since it came out actually in the in the mid '90s. So um, yeah, that that's a that's an interesting one. Let's see uh, let's see how far I get. I've started putting together the 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 components, shall we say, the form and the bigger picture. Let's see how drilled into the details I end up getting. But um, yeah, welcome back to the podcast. Hopefully, we can get some solutions happening as to how to make this more regular and where to put it, how to do it. Um, what works, what doesn't. Again, all the physical books are flying off the shelves and to the post office and out to you good folks. Um, signed copies, excuse me, signed copies all over the world now. So uh, yeah, just check it all out. com, And I'll see you guys again on the next one.